So Trump's so-called revised travel ban came into partial effect today at 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time as a result of the Supreme Court's ruling this week. And given that it's a huge bureaucratic endeavor to actually implement this order and make sure that all the relevant bureaucrats have the correct directives, uh, we are expecting some level of chaos and attitude and all the expected pitfalls of what this entails. So there are legal aides who have set up at the terminal um, to assist with anybody who might have a family member or a loved one who is caught up in the bureaucratic jump. And uh, as of now, there's a whole lot of drama to report on, but these kinds of things are pretty tedious. Um, so we will be sifting through that tedium for your edification. Given the ambiguity of the Supreme Court's standard that they promulgated, yeah. meaning the, bon the yeah, bona fide right. relationship right. standard, do you worry that individual customs agents might not have the capacity yeah, or the, to be able to interpret that standard on their own? Is there so any, was, too much ambiguity there? I was worried about that going in, but now I am less concerned about that from a customs official standpoint. The reason I'm less concerned about it is it was made very clear that if a visa holder enters this country, the executive order will have no impact on that visa holder. By contra and, and that visa, someone without a visa couldn't get on the airplane in the first place to travel to this country. So the standards that are at stake in terms of interpreting who ought to get a visa aren't really relevant to those who are implementing these orders here. Those standards are really important moving forward when it comes to what the State Department is going to say about whether someone's eligible for a visa. But the customs worker here doesn't have to contend with those issues because the question is a pretty basic one. Is there a visa or is there not? And if there's not, there may be other reasons why someone's allowed to stay. But if there is, the executive order has no impact. Do you think there's any danger that given the relative lack of havoc this time around, at least compared to yeah. January, that there might be less public attention to the fundamental arbitrariness of the order? I don't know. I mean, one of the aspects of being in public service right now is engaging all of us as citizens of this country to assure that the ideals of the country is based are actually realized. And I think it's very important, one of the reasons to be here is to underscore that we have to be vigilant about protecting those rights. Whether people get complacent about that, I can't say. All I can say for sure is that we're not going to in my office. Could you just talk a little more specifically about how Los Angeles in particular has been impacted? What, what, are, what circumstances are unique to Los Angeles that have made it get, produced an adverse effect from all this? Well, you know, as we're well aware, we have immigrant populations from almost every nation in the world here, you know, and those populations in many cases now for other reasons are living in fear every day in our society. We have university students from all over the world who come back and forth. Our economy here is based heavily on tourism. There are so many aspects of immigration issues, travel bans and so forth that could have a huge impact on everyday life here on our streets. Right. And in the, in the order that was issued, a bona fide relationship that was speculated yeah. could exist for a student who has been granted admission to a university, yes, right. but not necessarily for a prospective student who's coming to, say, toward the university, yeah. which speaks to sort of the arbitrary quality of all this. Yes, I'm very concerned, again, about the State Department's interpretation, and I, I'm going to look with great care at what Hawaii filed, apparently, today in regard to that. Uh, I think that interpretation has been too narrow from what I, everything I've seen so far. And again, just looking at the standpoint of just a family member, my grandmother isn't doesn't have a bona fide relationship with me. That's what the State Department's first order says. Okay. Sure. 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 Sure.
Okay. Okay, so I'm with Masih Fulati, advocacy manager of CARE, the uh, Los Angeles branch. And we are here at the Tom Bradley International Tour. The Trump so-called travel ban has just gone into effect at 5 o'clock. That's, I don't know, half hour or so ago now. What happened in practical terms, do you think, at 5 o'clock? So the new guidelines that the administration um, published last time go into play. Um, CBP officers are now able to use their discretion um, to view whether an individual has a valid visa before the effective date of the executive order. And if they don't, they'll be able to, um, again, examine whether there's a familial tie. Uh, realistically, we expect individuals who are traveling today to already have had their visas issued prior to the 26th. But what we're really here to do is uh, monitor the situation, see if people are experiencing delays, if there's an abuse of power, or if the policy, policies aren't uh, being uh, implemented uh, correctly. And if they aren't, then we're here to take legal action. And how would you be informed if there was some kind of abuse of power? How does it work mechanically? Would it be that people who's are waiting for family members to arrive, would approach you at this table here that's been set up. How, how kind of in practice would that work? That's actually a really good question. Um, what we're doing is uh, taking two different steps. One is we're telling everyone, if you're going to be traveling, please register your travel with CARE or one of the other great partners that are here. We have a, a CARE LA representative, a public council representative, ACLU, One Justice, Asian American Advancing Justice, all present here today. Um, go ahead and report your travel before you come into the country. That way we have documents ready. We know we're in contact with your family members. Now if there's a delay and your plane has arrived and you haven't come out in an hour, two hours, three hours, that family member can be in contact with us and we can monitor it, see what's going on and then take proper legal action. If you aren't able to register your travel before you're coming in, then what we're doing is again making our rounds with these groups. Uh, we have uh, key flights identified um, that are coming in from Europe and other countries that we think impacted in the individuals possibly can be on, or at least individuals from Muslim majority countries. And then as those flights are coming on, asking your passengers, is there anyone that you notice on the flight that didn't come out? Asking family members who might still be waiting here, um, is there anything we can do? And then we have a table set up here that says free legal advice, so people know enough and they've been seeing the candles coming around, they've been seeing us walk around with intake forms and they can report each of so. So, as you mentioned, there is a whole group of legal advocates here offering assistance. How does something like that come into existence? Um, how is it organized? What kind of, um, kind of infrastructure is in place so that on relatively short notice, you can assemble a group like this and get them to the airport and have all the resources that we need? So, I have to give a lot of credit to all of these established organizations who once they saw that uh, uh, President Trump was elected into office, we got together, we started talking to one another, we recognized the rhetoric, the problematic rhetoric that he was using throughout his election, and we knew that we had to make, combine forces to make sure we had the capacity to deal with issues like this. So when the first Muslim ban came out, we set up infrastructure um, to be able to have access to attorneys, to volunteers, to translators, and we've maintained those relationships throughout this process. So there's a few people here today from different organizations, but there's many more volunteer attorneys who came out during the first Muslim ban and who have continued to express interest in helping out. If we need their resources, if we need their time, they made themselves available and they're only a call away. Um, additionally, we have individuals outside protesting with actions being organized for next Friday. Um, we just want to make sure that people understand this brand is just as problematic as the first brand, um, and we need to continue to press until the Supreme Court gets to hear the substance of um, this case in October. Right. One, one issue that with this ban that you mentioned before is that it vests individual uh, individual customs agents with a huge amount of power over they believe somebody has a quote modified relationship with a U.S. person or entity. Um, is, is that a major factor, you think, that in terms of the ambiguity of that standard and how it will actually be enforced on the ground? Not only how it will be enforced, but how it's being interpreted by the administration. So this bona fide relationship, um, we're saying that it's applicable to a daughter 
uh, or uh, son or a daughter, a brother or sister, but not a grandparent, not a fiance. It's very arbitrary. Um, and again, you, you take a look at how this is going to separate families and the impact it has, especially on the refugee community. Uh, we're saying that relationship with a uh, university um, or a business, a place of employment is okay, but then a uh, relationship with a re refugee resettlement uh, organization isn't okay. Um, so it's going to really impact those who need um, the, our assistance the most, our help the most, and need security and peace and all the values that America is supposed to stand for. Freedom of religion, um, freedom of speech, and we're limiting that um, with this Muslim man, this discriminatory Muslim man. Yeah, you know, familial bonds are important, obviously, but I always wonder, you know, if you have just a platonic bond with somebody, so say you have a lifelong friend, and you know, that friend resides in California, and they have a, or their friend is in Iran or something, is that not a, how is that not a bona fide relationship? I mean, it just seems arbitrary. I, I couldn't agree more. I think this administration has demonstrated a lot of times that they, they just want to put their agenda forward. They don't really care about the chaos that's caused or the people on the ground who are being impacted. Um, for an administration that wants to make America great again, they're not doing a great job of it. Um, they're tearing um, into the fabric of this country, which is uh, relies on freedom of religion, freedom of speech, um, and we are um, really damaging how we look in the international community. We're supposed to be a country that stands up for people's rights, and, and that, that's not what we're doing. Here. Yeah, just in another example of the arbitrariness. You know, you could imagine a Sudanese student wanting to come to the United States and maybe tour different universities and determine whether they want to attend one. They may not have a pre-existing bona fide relationship with any of those universities, but they're there for a good faith, they're coming for a good faith reason, which is to view U.S. universities that they may want to, may want to enroll in. Um, but they would presumably be barred under the criteria that have been promulgated. Yeah, we're putting these barriers um, in place um, to come into this country, but we still want uh, to take that leading role um, in the world. And uh, again, there's the, a the conflict there. We, we have to understand that any policies that we're putting into place, how does it really impact how the world sees us? And how does it really impact Muslim Americans here and other impacted um, groups here? And I don't think this administration has thought that through. Um, I think they're, they're really searching for a victory after being rejected court after court after court. Um, and th this is the only thing that they were um, able to kind of muster out. Um, but hopefully when uh, October comes around, uh, the Supreme Court will rule in a way to make sure that these relationships and this discrimination that's clearly been take, taking place um, doesn't stand for long. And, and finally, um, Southern California in particular, is, in particular is home to a lot of refugee populations, um, so it's probably just been disproportionately impacted by these various bans. Could you talk a little bit about how this region in particular is taking the brunt of all that's going on? Sure, I'm an Iranian-American. The first time around um, when the Muslim man came, uh, Iranians and LAX were disproportionately targeted. Uh, the translators that we needed most uh, than all were people who knew how to speak Farsi. Uh, there's also a large uh, Syrian population, many of whom are refugees, um, as well as uh, individuals in the Yemeni community who reside in Los Angeles. So anytime, LAX is one of the largest airports in the country, anytime any kind of policy like this comes into play, it's going to disproportionately uh, impact Southern California and the diverse community here. And that's unfortunate because the diversity of LA is what America really stands for and is what we should be working for, not trying to limit. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you.